welcome to Windows on Worship. My name is Carl and it's wonderful to have you with us today, especially if this is the first time you've ever tuned in to Windows on Worship. You're very welcome. This week we're going to be thinking about what it means to sow seeds of hope and to be people who are known for both sharing and being good news in the things that we say and in the things that we do. Before we get started, you might like to download your worship sheet for this week, which is helpful in guiding you through the act of worship in showing you the prayers that we might share together, for example. In order to download that, you will find the link just below the video in YouTube, but you may need to click on show more to reveal it. On your worship sheet, you will find the order that we're going to be following and some prayers for us to say together as we move through the act of worship. You'll also find some red YouTube icons. These indicate suggested videos designed to accompany the main video. You may wish to watch these by interspersing them with the main video, perhaps using a separate tab on your browser, or by coming back to them later on and using them to help you to continue to reflect and ponder and pray throughout the week. On the reverse side of the sheet, you will find the jukebox playlist, which is this list of suggested videos. It's also available in the playlist, which accompanies this video. A link to that will pop up right towards the end. Or you could go to the Windows on Worship channel page and scroll down to the bottom. There you'll find all of the suggested playlists. Finally, turning back to the front side of your worship sheet, You'll also find some blue computer icons. These indicate places where you might wish to share your thoughts and comments and prayers with others. You could do that either in the main comments section for this video or by using the live chat function in YouTube, which might be particularly helpful if you're tuning in to the premiere of this video. So we begin our act of worship today with our opening responses, which you'll find on the worship sheet. As we work our way through this act of worship, you'll notice that there are words in bold type, which are there for us to share together. Please join in with those either in your head or out loud if you're comfortable doing so. So let us pray. We gather together in our separate places. We are gathered together by the Spirit. We come to worship and to hear good news. We are shaped and changed by God's word. We long to be people who radiate God's love. We are held in love that never lets us go. So now we've gathered together, we're ready to bring to God our prayers of adoration, our prayers of praise. And this week our prayer is based on Psalm 65, which speaks of God at work in creation. So let us pray. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed, O to you who answer prayer. To you all flesh shall come. When deeds of iniquity overwhelm us, you forgive our transgressions. Happy are those who you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength, you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silenced the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the earth and water it, you greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, 
and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be for ever. Amen. We come now to our prayers of renewal. These are prayers that give us space to bring before God those things in our own lives that we both want to say sorry for and which have caused us pain. And to acknowledge before God also those dynamics in the life of our world in need of transformation and renewal. Again, you'll find the words for these prayers on the worship sheet. Let us pray. God of love and life, you came to reconcile all things to yourself in Christ and to renew the heavens and the earth. We bring to you those things in our own lives and within the life of the world we share in need of transformation and fresh hope. We bring to you those things for which we are sorry. God of mercy, forgive us. We bring to you the burdens we carry and the sorrows we bear. God of love, comfort us. We bring to you the brokenness and oppression in our world. God of justice, disturb us. We bring to you the times that we've hidden from the risks of love. God of courage, fortify us. And we bring to you the failures of your church to stand for justice. God of liberation, convict us. God of love and life, you came to reconcile all things to yourself in Christ and to renew the heavens and the earth. Set us free to follow you and to share the good news of love. Amen. Hovered over the swirling deep in the beginning, bringing to birth the words of the word. I shaped, tended, sparked, thundered. It was I who crafted the galaxies, set the stars ablaze, moulded new worlds, brought forth life. Life that creeps and crawls. Life that swoops and soars. Life that dives and drifts. And it was I who birthed the strangest creature of all, breathing life into its soul and fire into its bones. Through me, the words of the word were scattered, like seeds sown in the wheat field of the human heart. Some would bounce off the heart's hardened ground. Some would struggle to put down roots amid rocks. 
some will be choked off by worldly weeds. Yet I would faithfully tend the ground, the hard and the rocky and the thorny. I broke up and filtered and weeded, making good soil, bringing forth new life, moulding hope preparing the ground for the words of the word, to spring into wheat that nourishes the soul, through life and beyond the threshold of death. Today we're thinking about being and sharing good news. But what does this good news look like, sound like, feel like? Some of our Windows on Worship regulars have sent in their thoughts. What being good news means to me? Good news to me is the word and is the word of God. I know the word of God is God. So. If we want to live the good news, then we must believe in the word of God, which is love. And if I have to live the good news, then my life we should reflect God. And if it's reflecting God, then it must reflect love to all that I do, all that I say, people that I meet. That the way I, do, I, I talk to people the way I live my life should reflect God. During this pandemic, the way people have put others before themselves, people on the front line, the charity workers, people leaving their families to stay in homes for f weeks. And that is love, because without love, we cannot do this. So living the good news is living love. What is good news? Well, part of Jesus' manifesto, reading from the book of Isaiah, was to set the prisoners free. For over 40 years, I have participated in Amnesty International's Urgent Action Network, sending letters, faxes, and nowadays emails, asking government officials around the world to stop imprisoning people without a fair trial resulting from a corrupt justice system. As the Amnesty International website says, because of the actions of individuals, lives have been saved, unfair laws have been changed, the wrongfully imprisoned have been released. Your actions make a difference. To me, that is good news. Our reading for today is known as the parable of the sower and you'll find it in Matthew's Gospel chapter 13 verses 1 to 9 and then 18 to 23. As we listen to this reading you might like to take note of any particular words or phrases or ideas that really jump out at you and you might wish to make a note of them on your worship sheet. These could be the things that the Holy Spirit is particularly wanting to highlight and to bring to your attention today. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the lake. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprung up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. 
But the seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Jesus said to his disciples, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the words of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what's sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root and endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in one other sixty, and in another thirty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. My knowledge of gardening is, admittedly, rather more limited than I would like it to be. I'm afraid I simply don't know what the vast majority of plants in my garden are actually called, or what the best conditions for growing them in actually are, or even whether they're annuals or perennials in many cases. During the lockdown, I've been spending more time out in my garden, and so in an effort to improve my knowledge, I have occasionally tuned in to Gardener's World. There was one episode of Gardener's World in which Monty Don was planting some seeds, and I noticed he was very careful to plant each seed several centimetres along from the next one, presumably so that they each then have enough space to grow and to spread out maybe as time goes on. In the process of planting each of these seeds, he made a small hole in the soil for each of them. He added a bit of compost in, and when he put the soil back, he watered everything really thoroughly. It struck me as a very thoughtful and careful process. And it's very unlike what we appear to have when we think about the strategy of the sower in today's parable. Even I, ignorant as I admit I am, know enough about gardening to know that wasting so much seed by indiscriminately scattering it around on paths and onto rocky ground and among thorns is not a good strategy. And yet, and yet Jesus talks about the seed which does take root, yielding huge quantities, quantities well beyond what could be achieved in reality, even with modern day intensive farming techniques. And so it begs the question, what actually is going on in this parable? In his commentary on this reading from Matthew's Gospel, Tom Wright, who was a one-time Bishop of Durham, remembers visiting the lake at Galilee and standing by an inlet, not unlike the one that a large crowd once gathered around to listen to Jesus. Apparently there are quite a few such areas on the edge of the lake just to the west of Capernaum. And that day the group's tour guide rode out into the middle of this inlet, using a boat that he'd borrowed from a local fisherman, and addressed the crowd, taking advantage of the really excellent acoustics in that space, just as Jesus himself had once done 2,000 years previously. For Tom Wright, this spectacle really brought today's reading to life. It reminds us that what's described here is an entirely plausible scenario. Jesus really did row out and sit down on this boat, which sitting down was a typical rabbi's pose, as the crowds that were left on the shore listened to what he had to say. It makes sense Jesus did this, I reckon, because earlier in the Gospels, we hear that um, there are large crowds that like to gather around Jesus and really press in tightly. 
They hope to be able to speak to him. They hope to be able to touch him, sometimes just to touch his clothes. Anybody who's ever experienced being surrounded by groups of people who all seem to want a word with us, and in some cases who treat our bodies like public property, will appreciate, I think, Jesus' need for a bit of breathing space. When Jesus the rabbi began to teach, he told himself what he himself later called the parable of the sower. And he concluded this by saying, if you've got ears, listen. And I think what he meant by that was, you're really going to need to think about this. I'm not going to make it too obvious for you. Jesus was somebody who was an absolute master of engaging his audience by using stories that were really designed to make them do the share of the work rather than just spoon feeding them the right answers in inverted commas. His parables often defy straightforward, easy explanations. And the more you delve, the more you realise there's more and more layers to them. And that means that they require really thinking through, really chewing them over, ideally in the company of others who bring different perspectives. And taking them seriously may well mean changing our minds as a result of what we find out in this process of engagement. Now Jesus was offering this parable in a situation where expectations were running very high. Many thought that Jesus was the one who would come to finally set Israel free from Roman oppression and occupation. And the parable probably set them off on that train of thought because Isaiah and Jeremiah, hundreds of years before Jesus, had used similar imagery of seeds and of sowing to speak the word of God in troubled times for the people of Israel. In a heightened atmosphere where many were indeed longing for violent rebellion, I imagine some in the crowd really did believe that Jesus was their longed for military messiah, if I could put it like that. However, this parable, when you actually listen to what it has to say, doesn't play to the gallery in that way. Instead, it points to a need to let go of prior expectations and to actually hear what Jesus has to say in his own terms, having grappled with the true meaning of the story. So just what was Jesus getting at within this parable of the sower? Well, as readers, we have an advantage over the first hearers of this parable in that we can have a look at the explanation that Jesus gave to his disciples later on in a rather less public setting. The seed here is the key message that Jesus came to bring, which was that the kingdom of God had come near in his very person. God's hope is shared freely and abundantly as this seed is extravagantly scattered around. However, some who hear just don't understand. This is like the seed landing on hardened ground, the hardened ground of the pathways. Some who hear initially respond with great joy, but it's not easy to put down deep roots in mid rocky ground. And at the first sign of commitment becoming costly, they turn away. Yet others do hear and do understand, but other priorities, the cares of the world and the power of wealth, act like thorns and weeds that starve them of substance and choke off their faith. However, some of the scattered seed does take root, as people both hear and understand what Jesus is about. And in these cases, deep roots are put down, yielding a harvest of lives transformed by the love of God. So I think what Jesus is doing here is inviting these crowds gathered by the Sea of Galilee to leave behind their prior expectations of him and instead follow him in seeking the kingdom of God, which is all about hope and new beginnings and the love of God manifest in the way our world actually works in practice. But this wasn't easy. We know that various of his own disciples found this very hard. They ran away like seeds sown on rocky ground 
when matters came to a head as Jesus was arrested. The rich young ruler of Matthew 19 was like seed sown among the thorns and the weeds, close to the kingdom of God on one level, yet unable to make God his top priority when he was told that this would mean laying aside his wealth. And we know from the New Testament that lots of people just didn't understand Jesus at all and rejected him because of that, like the seed landing on the hard ground of the pathways. All of this means that we might be tempted to read this parable as being about striving to be like good soil into which God can plant seeds carefully like Monty Don did, seeds that will develop roots and yield much fruit. But I think this understanding of striving to be like good soil does miss the point slightly. You see, nowhere in this does Jesus say that it's our role to change ourselves into good soil when we realise that we each have something of the other three types of ground within our hearts. We cannot redeem or transform ourselves. What we can do, though, is we can recognise that God in Christ never gives up on us, even when the ground of our hearts is hard or rocky or full of thorns and weeds. The seeds of God's love will continue to be scattered extravagantly. And it's the same Holy Spirit present when God spoke the word of creation who tends that ground. It's that same Holy Spirit who breaks up the hardened soil and digs out the rocks and weeds out the thorns. Now experiencing that is not always easy. It requires us being open to an often painful and difficult and costly process. And yet it's the process by which God patiently brings new life and plants seeds that yield much fruit. More often than not, God does this by making use of flawed human beings like me and like you. So to be a disciple, then, is to be one who scatters the seeds of God's love through what we say and what we do. We are called as disciples to share and to be good news for all. And this sharing and being good news means serving others. It means working towards social justice and it means sharing our stories of faith. This sharing our stories of faith is otherwise known as evangelism. It saddens me, friends, that evangelism is sometimes seen as a dirty word in parts of the church, perhaps because it's become so associated with a version of Christianity that seems to have very little to do with love. However, the core of what evangelism is actually about is simply the sharing of stories. Stories that are like the parables of Jesus in that they make people pause and ponder, wrestle and wonder, and maybe even change their minds. Now there's a lot more to say about the actual doing of evangelism than can be said easily here today. We'd want to think, for example, about how we do it appropriately and ethically, keeping in mind that we've got two ears and one mouth in that ratio for a very good reason. And as the parable of the sower reminds us, not all of the seeds we sow will yield fruit. It's easy to be discouraged when we share our stories of faith with other people and make ourselves vulnerable and we end up being rejected. And yet we're called to continue in loving ways to take this risk to take the risk of sharing the good news of God's love. Not because we're worried about bums on seats in church services, that misses the point completely, but because we've been given a gift of love and grace and hope. And it's a gift that multiplies 30 or 60 or even 100 fold when we give it away. So friends, may we be people who truly are good news scattering seeds of love and life. Amen.
We come now to our prayers of intercession, our prayers for others. As we pray, if you've got particular things that you would like the Windows on Worship crew to pray for, um, please do type them into the comments section on YouTube, particularly if you're watching the premiere and using the live chat function. There is a response in these prayers. When I say sower of new life, can you please respond either in your head or out loud by saying, hear our prayer. So let us pray. God of hope and love and life, we bring our prayers for transformation before you now. Sower of new life, hear our prayer. We pray for the breaking up of the ground where our hearts have become hardened and your words of love and life bounce off us. We lay before you the times when we have failed to see the humanity of others and been prejudiced. When we've assumed the worst of those who were different to us. When we've been quick to judge and slow to listen. And when we've turned a blind eye to injustice and suffering. God of love and hope and life, break up the hard ground of our hearts so that seeds of new life might grow and flourish. Sower of new life, hear our prayer. We pray for the clearing out of that ground when our hearts have become rocky and our commitment to you has diminished. We lay before you the times when we've placed self-interest before the needs of the vulnerable. When we've shied away from speaking words of truth and hope. When we've walked by on the other side when stopping means sacrifice. And when we've missed opportunities to share and to be good news. God of love and hope and life, clear out the rocky ground of our hearts so that seeds of new life might grow and flourish. Sower of new life, hear our prayer. We pray for the weeding of the ground where our hearts have been taken over by thorns and weeds and the cares of world and wealth have choked off our faith. We lay before you the times when we have valued affluence and its trappings more than we valued you. When we've treated you like a consumer product to be used and then discarded. When we've cared more about status and power than we have about kindness and care. And when our churches have become indistinguishable from just another social club. God of love and hope and life, weed out the thorns and weeds growing in our hearts so that seeds of new life might grow and flourish. Sower of new life, hear our prayer. In a time of quiet, we bring our prayers for others to you. Sower of new life, hear our prayer. And so we bring everything that we've been thinking about and praying about together by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Please do so using whatever language or form is most familiar to you 
and either in your head or out loud as you're most comfortable. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So thank you for joining us for Windows on Worship. I hope you found this act of worship helpful and thought-provoking. If you're not already a subscriber, there'll be a subscribe button that will pop up towards the end of this video. Please do click on that. It will enable you to receive updates about when the next Windows on Worship service is coming along. There's also, as I said at the beginning, a jukebox playlist to go with this act of worship. And a link for that will pop up as well at the end of this video. But for now, we come to our prayer of blessing. As you go about your daily life, as you seek to be disciples where you are, in your work, at home, among friends, online, may you do so with the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. May that liberate you and free you to be and to share good news with all. Amen. Thank you.